Bom dia. Sim. Good morning. Bom, é, meu nome é Anderson Santana. Eu sou professor na Faculdade de Engenharia de Alimentos da Universidade Estadual de Campinas. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Anderson Santana. I'm professor in food science uh, at Faculty of Food Engineering, University of Campinas. I'll be coordinating the work this morning. So uh, the first speaker is Dr. Svetoslav Todorov from University of Sao Paulo. He's going to speak about probiotic meat products. So let me introduce Professor Todorov. Professor Todorov is a visiting professor at the Department of Food Science and Experimental Nutrition, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He has a master degree in diplomatic and international relations at Free Faculty of Diplo Diplomacy, University of Sofia, Sofia, Bulgaria. His research fields are molecular taxonomy of lactic bacteria isolated from isolated from fermented foods, characterization of bacteriocins produced by lactic bacteria purification of polypeptides and small proteins, probiotic lactic acid bacteria, physiology and biochemistry of lactic acid bacteria, and medical applications of the bacteriocins produced by lactic acid bacteria. Slav, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Well, um, can I be a more democratic with you? So let's do the voting first. I give you options language that you can use. You have choose, you can choose between uh, Bulgarian and French. Okay, uh, so no, no democracy, we'll do it in Portuguese. <laughs> well, it's look like a democracy in Brazil. You give the option, then you decide what you want. I'm bad. This, now I know I don't want to extend my visa here because I'm making so much jokes about the government. <laughs> well, um, okay. Uh, what do you think um, could be in English or in Portuguese? The students, are you happy with the English? Uh, let's do it in English. And uh, then if you have the questions, I can repeat some things in Portuguese. Then most probably will not understand nothing on my Portuguese, but um, we, we will try. We have the people that can help with translation to Portuguese if we need it. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Adriana, for the invitation. It was really uh, nice uh, to be in Limeira. And every time I was confusing that I'm going to Campinas, and then she was saying, no, you're going to Limeira. No, I will go to Campinas. No, you're going to Limeira. So, but it's a really nice place here. And we was treated uh, in the last uh, two days really like a VIP. So can I stay longer? Uh, I would uh, do the same treatment. Okay, okay, I will uh, send email to my boss himself all that I'm moving to Limera, so. But then it's, uh, I'm like uh, uh, the French people when I was studying in France, they were telling, you're like um, cockaracha. Once you go inside the house, you never go out. So be ready, I will stay forever here. Because I'm already 10 years in Brazil. Uh, arrived here with a contract like for one year. Then uh, start uh, second year, then another one, then another one, then another one. Then they decide uh, to kick me out of Sao Paulo, though I went to Minas Gerais, work in Vissosa University for almost three years. Then they opened the position back in Sao Paulo. Quickly I move, uh, put everything in my suitcase and go back to Sao Paulo because someone from Minas here. Any Mineiro? Okay, Minas Gerais, it's a very nice place. They have the Pau de they have the good food. Um, University of Vissosa is perfect. It's a really nice place to study. Only the problem is far, 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 muy too far, muy too far away. <laughs> uh, this is only the problem. So, uh, but anyway, so let's uh, start with the uh, uh, work. Uh, something that um, was asked by Adriana to present about the probiotic meat products. And then I was thinking, okay, the probiotic meat products is a very good point. But then, uh, we really need the uh, probiotic meat products. How we can convince the people to eat more meat, because the Brazilians eat a lot of meat, but then it's not just to eat the meat, to eat the fermented meat products, because fermented meat products, in fact, can be a very nice um, a vector to deliver the probiotic for the customers. 
especially if you like a uh, fermented meat product, it's a good excuse to eat a little bit more and to say, okay, it's healthy, I would have this product. But then it's another point. We think about the uh, meat products, but then uh, when we put the probiotic inside, we need to be sure that this probiotic will be there for a long time in an adequate condition. Then this uh, uh, poor lactic acid bacteria will survive there. She will like to be there and to be really safe. So we'll, I will try to touch the different aspects of these uh, uh, points of the um, uh, beneficial properties of the lactic acid bacteria when they go to the meat product, how they can survive there. Are they really safe for us? They can make maybe some problems sometimes. So some uh, points around uh, this, uh, like uh, how they say several times uh, in Brazil, uh, under the, this umbrella to, to manage uh, the things um, that I want to, to say. So the first uh, problem we need uh, when we develop the new product, we need to uh, cover the different aspects of this uh, product. From one side, we want to have the, some beneficial properties of, of the product. We want to have the probiotic properties, technological properties, bacteria in productions. And if we manage to get in, inside this middle uh, small place to cover uh, all these kinds of things, it will be perfect. But the problem is not always working like that. Just a one example, if you have the lactic acid bacteria, that is a very good technological property, so like a production of, uh, exo, uh, of uh, uh, some ex, uh, exo, uh, uh, protease enzymes. It's very good for do the proteolytic, uh, prote uh, proteolytic pr um, processes in the meat product to, to give the uh, uh, to cut some of the proteins, excellent. But this uh, uh, lactic acid bacteria, for sure, not going to be a bacteriocin producer, it cannot control the other microorganisms because if he produces, uh, is the, the this lactic acid bacteria producing the some um, proteolytic enzymes? For sure, this proteolytic enzyme will destroy the bacteriocin. So it's not going to work together two of them. So we need to always look for some uh, uh, way that we can cover most of this uh, criteria. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, several people were talking lactic acid bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, but we need to always remember the people that the lactic acid bacteria is not a taxonomical group. This is just a, uh, like a group of the bacteria with the same uh, metabolitic um, uh, future. So we have the rod that is lactobacillus and carnobacterium. And we have some cocci that much more of them are cocci, lactococcus, enterococcus, streptococcus, oconostoc, vicella, pediococcus, ta 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 ta, and muito, uh, several others. And a very good point uh, working with lactic acid bacteria is the fact that you can actually put your name on the way of the new species. The reason it's uh, taxonomy of the lactic acid bacteria is most of the time is based on the like uh, 20th century or the biochemical and physiological feature of this uh, bacteria. So these days we're using a lot of biomolecular approaches to do the uh, uh, taxonomy of this bacteria and very often we have the good evidence to uh, separate some of the, uh, to uh, have a new species, uh, even new genuses. So if you think about uh, this uh, here in the corner, Oinococcus, before was uh, considered uh, being part of Leuconostoc and um, a friend of mine from South Africa, he uh, made it a study on these uh, strains and discovered, no, this is not Leuconostoc, this uh, is a new uh, genus, and in fact it's Oenococcus. Okay, this, time, uh, this stage is just the two species inside this genus, but it's uh, enough uh, genetic evidence to be separated in the new genus. So if you work with the lactic acid bacteria, uh, we can have the very uh, good op uh, um, option to discover the new species. And if you have the good uh, probiotic bacteria in producer species, you can always give the your name on this bacteria, so you can put your name on the list. But then if you have the strain with the several virulence factors, very dangerous strains, you can put the name of your mother-in-law. So she will be very happy without uh, know that you're actually making a very good joke with her. In Bulgaria, we don't like mother-in-law. But I think in Brazil as well. Even, uh, what's the name of this guy on the globe that presented every Sunday? Um, uh, in the evening on Sunday, is presenting on Globo. Uh, Faust? Faust? Como? See, Eli, uh, this guy always making jokes in Madelon. Maybe she has a problem as well. Um, anyway, 
So uh, what uh, the lactic acid bacteria can do for us? We have um, a lactic acid bacteria. We can use them as the medicine. We're using already them in the medicine, human and veterinary. We can use them in the food and feed industry. Uh, some of them are having producing different metabolites that is used in the chemistry. Uh, functional ingredients produced by the lactic acid bacteria. We have the probiotics. We, uh, uh, if someone don't know what is probiotic, better change the room and study a little bit more because we're repeating every single presentation what is the probiotic. And then we have the some starter culture in dairy, non-dairy products, antimicrobial agent produced by this uh, lactic acid bacteria, bioprecerative. Uh, in biopreservation or medical sector as well in the last years. Different enzyme, vitamins, sweetness, exopolysaccharides can be produced by the lactic acid bacteria. So the poor lactic acid bacteria, we, they are so much explored by us. So, uh, and they are really good because they can produce all these kinds of things and make our life much more easier. But something that I always uh, pay a lot of attention, it's antimicrobial compounds produced by the lactic acid bacteria. This is the reason because I work with the bacteria since so I will always want to push the story on my side. And the different um, uh, antimicrobial compounds can be produced by the lactic acid bacteria, could be organic acid, diacetyl, hydrogen peroxide, carbon dioxide, different low molecular weight antimicrobial substances, and of course the bacteria since. And even if we look for the, in the human history, Humans have always been using the lactic acid bacteria in different fermentation processes. And um, um, here in Brazil, you're happy, uh, lucky, because you have fresh food all around the year. You don't need to think about to store food for the period that will be no food. But think about the poor guy living in Norway or Sweden that is half year, it's cold and winter, snowing, no food. They needed to preserve the food. How can they preserve it in the past? There was no... Um, this uh, modern way of preservation, they was doing fermented food products. In this way, they was protecting the food products for the, uh, the winter that was no natural sources. Uh, bactericins, by definition, they are small uh, antimicrobial uh, peptides produced via the ribosomal uh, system of the bacteria, and normally they are active against closely related organisms. Well, this uh, definition is quite old now, and we have the several evidence to believe that um, uh, they could be actually active even against some other organisms, uh, even bacteria from the lactic acid bacteria can be active against some gram-negative in some specific conditions. Some of them can inhibit the growth of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosum even. Some of them have activity against yeast, fungus, uh, some viruses. So uh, getting more and more evidences to believe that uh, these antimicrobial substances can have the really um, good application. The bactericins uh, uh, from the lactic acid bacteria, in fact, was coming a little bit later because first was colicins been described in 1925. 28 first bactericins from the lactic acid bacteria get on the, um, on the um, scientific attention. And 33, 1933, it's nice in being discovered. He received his name uh, after that, and then uh, market in the several countries, starting from England, uh, been um, recognized by the World Health Organization, the European Union, U.S. Drug and uh, Food and Drug Agencies in the different times. And these days, it's uh, used uh, in the several countries in the world, especially for the biopreservation of dairy products. But uh, this is the reason, uh, because of the modification of this bacteriocin was not working very well in the meat products by some specificity of the, the nature of this bacteriocin. And these days we have uh, only niacin and pediocin PA1 that was more or less uh, world, world, world um, used. But then it's uh, several other bacteriocins already on the list. I was uh, having a discussion with uh, friends from um, the NISCO like a couple of uh, months ago. They say they already have ready to put on the market several bacteriocins. So just they wanted um, uh, to have this authorization from the um, uh, U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Agency, European Union uh, approval, uh, and the reason, once they have this approval, they are already, they know everything about these bacteria, and they are ready to be marketed, but the law say you are not allowed to put it. So in the moment when they have this authorization, there will be uh, more uh, uh, bacteria seem to be applied. But why we need them? Uh, in a parallel session later, we will have some um, veterinary application. In this room, we will be the food science, right? But then, uh, bacteriocin, they have, have the application in the food processes uh, as a biopreservative. They can have application in the veterinary practice because this is the way to go out of this, how I call, devil's circle 
of the antibiotic resistance. You have a new antibiotic in a couple of months or years, you have the resistance. You need a new antibiotic, you have the resistance. You have the new antibiotic, you have the resistance. And the good point, the bacteria in the, their mode of action is uh, slightly different. They're using some receptors that are essential for the cell life, so they could be a really um, uh, kind of answer to go out of this problem with antibiotic resistance. And obviously, maybe in 50 years will be resistance to them, but at least at this moment we can go out of this problem. If you think about uh, when the Fleming discovered the penicillin, everyone was happy. We finished with the diseases, we don't have any more problem, we have the antibiotics, we are uh, happy. So a couple of years later start the problem. So we need to always to remember that the bacteria are not stupid. They know how to protect themselves, and we need to be more clever than them to find a way to, to kill them. So this is the way maybe the bacteria at you know, this moment can help us to go out of this uh, problem. How they work? If you think about, uh, it's a very simple way. They're using uh, some receptors on the cell membrane, like uh, fact of niacin. They recognize the lipid too. They go inside the, the cell membrane, open the door in the cell membrane. In this way, they can actually destroy the cells. Some of them can destroy the cell wall, and again, the cell not feeling very comfortable, or even some of them can install in the cell membrane in case of the uh, class two succussin um, uh, bacteriocin, as well they do the disturbing of the uh, cell um, uh, target cells. How I mentioned earlier, some of the bacteriocin can be really active against some unusual activity, but that's a very uh, tricky point. We need to be really sure that you're using the pure bacteriocin when you climb this kind of activity. Uh, it's a very elegant work performed with the colleagues from Buenos Aires University. They were showing that uh, some herpes virus cannot replicate perfectly if the bacteriocin is present. So one of the proteins of the, the virus cannot be uh, replicated. This uh, protein missing, the virus cannot uh, continue his life. And was made with the pure bacteriocin from uh, uh, Muntisin uh, from Serella. Uh, and uh, it's a very good work because it's working with the pure bactericin and proving that the bactericin is responsible for this uh, mode of action. Very often the people was using cell-free supernatant of um, uh, lactic acid bacteria, but then the bactericin is not pure, it's uh, several other factors. And we know that the niacin together with EDTA can kill some um, gram negative, but then it's interaction between niacin and the EDTA. So we need to be really sure when we um, climb this kind of non-specific activity. But then uh, we need to think about something else, and I'm coming now to the problem with the probiotics, because uh, everything, in fact, it's a poison. Everything depends on the quantity that we give. In, if you think about, if you go to the pharmacy, everything that you buy in the pharmacy is a kind of poison. Just we take in the amount that is appropriate to kill the problem and to don't kill the host. And the Paracelsus uh, have this idea a long time ago that everything depends on the dose, the concentration that we apply. So what's the toxicity of the bacteria since? They are, uh, most of them, they are not toxic. And even the studies showing that the toxicity of the niacin, it's equal to the toxicity of the sodium chloride. So it's not a big deal. Because imagine uh, seven grams of per kilo niacin, you have the toxicity effect, but can you eat seven grams per kilo? I'm not going to talk about my body weight, but you can see that it's not a small amount of kilos here. So if you multiply by seven grams, I need to have a lot of niacin to have the toxic, toxic effect on me. So this is a good point, but then some of the bacteria in fact could be toxic. There was a study uh, uh, running uh, a couple of uh, years ago with the colleagues from South uh, Zeder uh, Hill Preto on Espy, and they were showing that some of the bacteria can actually can be very highly toxic, but they were toxic against cancer cell line. And in this work, we wanted to continue this uh, work because I think it, this is the way, in fact, to, to, to create the new way of treatment of the cancer. If you have that bacteria that is highly toxic against cancer cell line, but not toxic against healthy cells, then it's a way to, to be used. This is the, could be kind of application. So we're now uh, coming to the meat products. And then it's another problem. We can put the probiotic inside. It's OK, no problem. We can deliver this uh, probiotic. If the poor bacteria can survive in the condition of the making of this uh, fermented product, it's OK. Because yesterday, I think Adriano uh, 
was some mention about this problem with the dairy products, but very often um, uh, you can, um, uh, they can uh, not able to survive the, 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 these processes. But then it's another question. Are these bacteria that we're using, are they really safe? Because we isolated a bacteria from dairy products or from meat products, uh, and uh, we know that the genus or species uh, are safe. It, they have the grass, it's this specific strain have the grass status as well. Uh, if you think Lactobacillus plantarum, it's a bacteria that everyone say Lactobacillus plantarum is not a problem, it's a safe bacteria, they have grass, but then specific strain, maybe it's not the same thing. So we have this project, uh, we isolate several lactic acid bacteria from the chorizo, it's cutting here a little bit on the slide. And we have isolate Lactobacillus sacchi, Enterococcus faecium, Lactobacillus plantarum. And our first reaction was uh, maybe Enterococcus faecium is not a good idea to be used in the fermented meat products as a starter culture, as a technological important culture, as a bacteriocin producer culture. And we showed that these um, uh, strains have the probiotic potential and we wanted to see if um, they are really safe. So we uh, study um, uh, this Lactobacillus plantarum and he showed a very low cytotoxicity of the bacteriocin, so okay, it's a good point. But then uh, we wanted uh, to explore a little bit more. So uh, when we're talking uh, about the probiotic, we can have the probiotic in a different way. We can have them via the, uh, as a, a pharmaceutical products and we can have it as uh, um, different fermented food products. Personally, if I'm not sick, I prefer to have the probiotics on this way. If I'm sick, I will take it this one. But my personal opinion is I don't want, if I'm in the good uh, uh, health condition, to have the probiotic as a supplement. Just I don't need it. If I need, if I have the medical uh, case and I need, I will take. But uh, in day, everyday practice, I think it's much more better to have... Uh, as a fermented food product, the, the probiotics. And uh, the question is uh, uh, why we need them. Because uh, if you think about uh, one uh, bus going uh, from Paulista to Uspi, bus is full, how can bad person go inside? No way, because it's no space. The same thing, if we have the good bacteria in our gut and um, uh, it's no space for the bad bacteria, there will be more problem to go inside. And if you have the empty bus, the salmonella, etc., it's very easy to go and to colonize the, our gut. And the potential benefits, uh, I think I don't need to talk about this because we uh, already had several uh, questions about this. But again, um, how the Hippocrates says a uh, long time ago, uh, food could be medicine, medicine could be food. And this is important thing because having these fermented food products, in fact, we can have the beneficial effect of the uh, this lactic acid bacteria, the probiotic bacteria, in the same way when we have our food products. Well, coming back to the, this um, fermented food product that I was just talking about, the low cytotoxicity, we had this project, we isolate several bacteria, how I may already mentioned the different Lactobacillus sacchi, Enterococcus, Lactobacillus plantarum. We wanted to investigate presence of virulence factors inside them. So we checked the different virulence factors, including some uh, genes that are responsible for the production of biogenic amines because you don't want your uh, salami to smell like a hell producing uh, biogenic amines, obviously. And some of the lactic acid bacteria can have these genes. So we screen the presence of the virulence genes. And in case of Lactobacillus plantarum, that is a very good bacteria, and surprisingly, Enterococcus faecium, we don't detect any virulence genes on this panel. But then we had um, another plantarum and Lactobacillus sacchi doing the same test. And what we found, we found presence of two genes. Well, vancomycin resistance is not really surprising because several bacteria can have this uh, resistance, including uh, some Lactobacilli can have the... Uh, by resistant to vancomycin, not because of the gene, because of their normal physiological processes, but um, was um, addition to collagen was present in our plantarum and our sake. Then we check uh, other sake. There was a question because it's only addition to collagen. We have another sake from the same isolation batch. There was a problem because there was a hyaluronidase and sulfate protein. 
and terukoko surface protein presence in lactobacillus saki not supposed to be there but the gene was there we don't know how it appeared there maybe horizontal gene transfer or maybe just no one was looking before and was just uh, uh, always been ignored so obviously in this experiment we had in the uh, with this uh, uh, In these experiments with the strains isolated from Portuguese chorizo, uh, this strain was showing that not always that the reputation of the strain is enough to decide that the strain is safe. I show you that enterococcus was showing no presence of virulent genes, and Lactobacillus plantarum was presence, uh, showing presence of virulent genes. So every work needs to be done strain by strain, not uh, just. Uh, uh, going on the, the reputation of the species because sometimes this reputation could be a little bit a problem. Then we have another product, uh, Sharky. I don't need to explain what is Sharky because everyone knows what is Sharky here, right? No, the French, no. It's a, a dry meat and it's uh, made it in the very um, um, high uh, salt concentration, very low water activity, supposed to be safe. Normally, the, they keep it even in the supermarket at the room temperature because it's, I mean, with this low water activity, obviously not too many things will grow inside with this salt concentration, but there's uh, several lactic acid bacteria that surviving this condition. We isolate Lactococcus lactis from this strain. One girl from the lab, uh, Vanessa, uh, was uh, her PhD re related to this strain. And again, we wanted to see uh, what the was distribution of the virulence factor, and it was bad surprise. Was three virulence factor present in uh, this strain? So obviously, uh, you can use um, the antimicrobial peptides produced by the strain, but uh, not a really good idea to use the strain himself as um, uh, strain inside the, the food products. Then a uh, very nice strain of Lactobacillus saki isolate from linguisa. And uh, this strain was a very good bactericin producer, was even producing some untypical bactericins, and uh, was uh, used with uh, several pro uh, products, uh, investigated quite um, uh, uh, deep, uh, uh, but then was getting a bad surprise. The strain was carrying a big collection of five virulence factors, including hyronidase, enterococcal surface protein, addition to collagen, Cetulizine, vancomycin resistant genes, and definitely I don't want to have the food product to it fermented with this strain because it could be a, a actually a problem. Then uh, getting to a Bulgarian uh, salami that was uh, production of a, lactob it's a strain of Lactobacillus plantarum isolated from this uh, salami. And again, we wanted to go more and more. So we made it a panel of uh, more than 50 uh, different virulence genes, including different antibiotic genes. And it's very important when you do the antibiotic resistant genes, very often to look for them, not uh, just one gene from the operon of this antibiotic resistance, but several genes from this operon. Because if only one is present, maybe it's not a big deal. But if the, all of them are present, that could be a, a big problem. So. Uh, after the testing, we found that only the five uh, genes been present, and analysis of this um, of this uh, genes was actually showing that the vancomycin could uh, not have chance to be expressed because it's missing part of the other genes important for the expression of uh, vancomycin resistance, and uh, some of the other genes was really uh, cannot be considered like a big problem for plantarum because they are related with the expression of the other genes inside the the um, the genome of uh, Enterococcus in order to be uh, doing uh, their bad uh, uh, behavior. So uh, we can consider the strain as a safe, and we was uh, investigating even the application of this strain as a starter culture because we're showing a very good potential to be used as a starter culture for fermentation of salami and having a good uh, technological properties, as well producing the bacteria in inside the salami, we uh, detected the presence of the bacteria in. Uh, the strain was showing um, some even uh, uh, stimulation of the immune system, so it was looking like uh, we have the good uh, option to study uh, the, the, the um, uh, application of this strain in the real, uh, real product. 
But when we're talking about the, the safety of the strains, normally we consider it Lactobacillus supplantarum as a safe strain, Car some of the Carnobacterium as well, Lactococcus lactics, Enterococci normally have the better reputation. Streptococcus, we know that Thermophilus is a good one, all the rest of the Streptococcus was considered like a problematic, then was in last years maybe it will change because there are several researchers showing that Streptococcus infanteris can be considered as well as a safe and be, uh, been shown that it's a principal um, strain in the several uh, West uh, African countries as a principal strain in the milk fermentation products. Locunostoc mesenteritis pediococcus. So uh, most of them, they have grass status on this side and uh, on the other side, uh, they don't have the grass status. So uh, the question is, these strains are safe or not? It really, it's, it's a question that it's a one million question because how I was showing to you plantarum and physium, they don't have the virulent genes. Saki was showing one genes. Saki, Saki, plantarum, two genes. Uh, Lactobacillus lac is showing the two, three genes. Lactobacillus sac is showing the five genes. So obviously, just to sit on the, the, the grass status of the strains, we cannot really uh, decide if the strains are safe or not. We need to do really every uh, study before we apply the uh, one particular strain in the food product, we need to be sure that we investigate this specific, specific strain and to uh, detect uh, if they are really safe or not. Uh, then I was uh, participating in the project uh, run by Embrapa here, and they was uh, having this idea to isolate some lactobacillus to apply in the fermented uh, products. And we were starting from more or less 600 isolates First step was to do the uh, identification of the presence of virulence factors, and only, if I'm not wrong now, it's uh, like five or six strains was showing no presence of virulence factor, and they decided to work only with these five strains. They was decide all of them, even if it's one or two genes present, no, we don't want it. We don't want to take a risk. And I think it's very important of the um, moral um, uh, criteria of the every researcher to be really sure that it's not going to put a uh, new Frankenstein in the market. Because sometimes the people think more about the money than uh, the, the safety of the, the product, unfortunately. So we have the application now of the, some um, uh, Lactobacillus plantarum that was uh, producing plantaricin, the strain when isolated in South Africa from the sorghum beer. Uh, this product, it's a very strange, I tried, not like it. It, but a lot of people love native uh, from the region in South Africa, they love it. Uh, the strain being very well is uh, characterized, the bacteria seem described perfectly, the genetic organization, molecular structure of the, um, the, the structure of the protein. Um, the strain being characterized as a very good probiotic properties, including the uh, animal studies. Uh, Plantaricin being used as a sanitizer in the biofilm um, uh, elimination in the wine industry in the area of uh, Cape Town. The gene was being successfully expressed in the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So it was really very good work. But we wanted to try something different. We wanted to make salami. So we made it salami using the strain of Lactobacillus plantarum. We wanted to see if the, this strain is feeling well inside the product. But then we decided to do a little bit different. We used the Lactobacillus plantarum, that is bacteriocin producer. We used the Lactobacillus plantarum that we eliminated the plasmid that carrying the bacteriocin gene. So we have the bacteriocin negative variant of our strain. And then we used the Lactobacillus corvatus, the um, commercial strain that is uh, used for the fermentation of salami. And then we used the, uh, now the Brazilians not going to like too much this, this part because we made it salami by horse. Springbok, Blesbok, uh, Mutton, uh, ho um, so it was uh, the, the couple of times of different antelopes, normal beef, horse, and uh, mutton. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, in Brazil, people don't like to eat the horse uh, meat, but go to Italy. They will fight for the last piece of the horse meat. Italian like it. I don't like, but depends on the person. Well, so what is important? What's, that, what's, what's happened with this experiment? We showed that uh, uh, plantarum is feeling very good inside the salami. No problem, can grow very well, can survive very well. In the long time of like 80 days, uh, no, 70 days, uh, 72 days the experiment, salami was, uh, uh, the plantarum was feeling perfectly inside. 
survive the like smoking process in the beginning was no problem. More interesting was think that uh, we tried to challenge the product with listeria, and then listeria cannot survive. This is a good point. But listeria cannot survive if you use the lactobacillus plantarum that produced the bactericin. So this salami was completely safe, zero listeria. Salami that was made it with a uh, plantarum mutant that was no plasmid, that was not producing bactericin. Again, strain was perfectly uh, ha happy inside the product, but listeria as well. We detected a very high level of listeria. And how I often like to say, you can give this as a salami to your mother-in-law, and the first one you're keeping for yourself. And then we have the Lactobacillus corvatev as a starter culture. Listeria was reduced a little bit, but still uh, was listeria because corvatus, this corvatus is not producing the bacteria since against listeria. Everything's okay. We have the product. We have the uh, strain inside. Strain was doing part of the fermentation process of the salami, so it was good. Uh, so no, let's say not good. Uh, let's say uh, reasonable technological properties to, because we have another starter culture to do the fermentation process. Uh, we eliminate the problem, listeria. Strain is there, listeria was eliminated, but then what about the sensorial analysis of this product? You can make a product, you can put uh, to kill every pathogen, you can uh, deliver the perfect uh, strain that have the probiotic properties, but if you change the taste, who will eat this product? And the good point, the sensor analysis was showing no difference. The uh, panelists, the people, we, we use the two kind of um, Test. We have the, the trained uh, panel of the professional people that will check uh, the sensor analysis of this product. We use the second panel that was uh, non-trained persons, and the both the panel say no. The the, they cannot detect the difference between three types of salami. This one made it with the bacteriocin producer, with the mutant that don't produce the bacteriocin, and made it with the starter culture. So that the consumer cannot detect the presence of this strain inside. So this was, uh, was a good point. Then we have the another product, uh, was Enterococcus facium, producer of two bactericin, and it's very important because if this strain produces only one, no effect. We need the two proteins together to get uh, together to have the good antimicrobial activity. And this strain was isolated from piglets and was showing a very good activity against Listeria, Proteus vulgaris, uh, even with a very small uh, activity. Well, when we made it, um, the, the challenge study, we found that we need at least uh, some um, level of activity in order to have the, the good inhibition of uh, listeria because if you use the small amount of the bacteriocin, listeria was still growing very well. But if you use the little bit more bacteriocin, listeria was not feeling very comfortable. And it's very important in this kind of uh, test to take the samples here at 10 hours, close the mouth, 10 hours, to really to be sure that you don't have viable cells because very often the people do the, uh, on the spectrophotometer, they see there's no changes of the turbidity, but this means Listeria could be sleeping there, uh, not to really kill. But when we take a sample, we check the viability of Listeria, detecting that Listeria being very well killed. So we made it a pate, fish pate, with, um, uh, the local recipe, and then we uh, add semi-purified bactericin in one of the experiments. So we add uh, the uh, strain in another experiment, and it was very interesting. We observed that we can actually extend the shelf life of the product using the bactericin, even using the strain himself. So the strain was showing uh, reasonably good probiotic properties, but since it was enterococcus, there was uh, quite a uh, uh, resistance. They don't want enterococcus as a probiotic in uh, this time. But these days we know that several enterococcus could be used as a probiotic as well. But then um, we show that, okay, if you're afraid of the using enterococcus as a probiotic, you can use the bacteriocins and you can actually extend the shelf life, if I'm not wrong, was from like uh, seven uh, days of shelf life to like 10 days. For the fresh product, extending the shelf life almost with 50% more, it's actually it's a good uh, option. And then uh, coming to this uh, big problem, we think uh, we can use the uh, uh, probiotic to extend the shelf life. We can use them to uh, deliver them to the customers. But very often, this is kind of magic word. Uh, if you put the name probiotic on the label, people buying and really need uh, a high moral um, 
criteria of the researcher to be sure that they're putting the right thing. Because unfortunately, a lot of, of, the, a lot product, lot of products of, of the market, they was not true. If you think about uh, several products that you can see on the market, they put the name probiotic, but they are, are really probiotic. Uh, one good example, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, in the US, they're selling the soap that is a probiotic. Uh, I'm difficult to be convinced that the, this bacteria, the probiotic bacteria, can survive inside the soap for 10 years shelf life. Let, uh, I don't know. For me, it's, it's not the uh, right information. If you can manage to convince me that you can put the lactic acid bacteria maybe encapsulated, maybe protected inside the soap and can have the probiotic property after 10 years, okay. Show me this, but in my opinion, this is impossible. From the like simple idea of the physiology of the lactic acid bacteria, they cannot survive 10 years, even in lyophilized form in the product that is keep on the sh normal temperature. Soap is very aggressive uh, uh, chemical product, so it's a little bit difficult, but do you know, they know that the word probiotic selling everything. Uh, I was uh, checking some probiotic products in uh, in the market, don't want to mention the name of the company, not name of the country when I was doing this, but they was putting on the label, it's a, a yogurt uh, juice uh, drink. They contain probiotics, so it cannot detect nothing. No even single life self of the probiotic that they put on the label, but at the same time we detected Staphylococcus aureus inside the product. So how I say, the magic word selling everything. But then, in conclusion, uh, we can use the traditional medicine that can give us a great idea for our research because traditional medicine say we can use this product, we can isolate bacteria, found that uh, this bacteria in fact is responsible for the properties of the product. We can um, investigate this and found the answer why the traditional, traditional medicine was recommending this and having the scientific answers for application of this, uh, this product. We can use them. Uh, we need to always think about the safety of the lactic acid bacteria because, how I mentioned several times, the grass status is not enough. We need to investigate each strain on the strain level to be sure that we are giving the safe strain to the consumers. And antibiotic, uh, antibacterial potential, bacteria in antimicrobials, is a very important ad ad additional um, um, attribute for the probiotic bacteria because the probiotic bacteria don't need to be bacteria in producer but if they can produce it's even better we can use this uh, uh, and maybe um, we can use these strains as a good potential for biopreservation of the fermented uh, uh, products so can be applied in the potential probiotics so just to finish uh, don't be afraid to be innovative and creative when you do your research. Sometimes the ideas that you're proposing maybe you look a little bit crazy. Just remember that Ark of Noah was being built by only one amateur, the guy that was no degree, nothing, but they built something that survived. And Titanic and Costa Concordia being built by the professionalists and they don't finish uh, very well. And for the just the last slide, um, still it's a time. Uh, there will be a conference in uh, I'm using advertising, another meeting, a new meeting. Uh, will be a conference in Budapest on the probiotics, prebiotics, gut microbiota and health. And uh, first day of this conference on the 8th will be dedicated to the uh, bacteria and antimicrobial peptide symposium. Just uh, I put the, the, the part of the program on the bacteria because I will be in charge of the bacteria in part. And then on the next three days will be uh, uh, discussion on the uh, probiotics and this conference is uh, in the last couple of years is getting like one of the more important in the world because it's really managed to put the professionals from all around the world well they wanted to do every I'm a little bit skeptical I think it's better to be every second year but well they decided to be every year so if you have uh, still the time to apply for grant and go there the deadline for the submission of the abstract is still end of the May and will be held in the Budapest on 18 to 21st of June. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. I want to acknowledge uh, all the colleagues that I had in the past uh, 15 years uh, from uh, different research groups from Europe, 
from uh, all around the Latin America. They uh, people from uh, Tucumán, from Serrela, uh, Buenos Aires, uh, Colombia, Venezuela, all around Brazil. Uh, colleagues from South Africa, South Korea. And uh, how I like to say that the work in this area cannot be done by one group. You need to have the collaboration and to put the best of every group inside to have the progress of uh, your work. So, muito obrigado pela sua atenção. Agora é hora para perguntas. Só que eu não vou responder. A Adriana vai responder a minha meu lugar. Aqui, Jean Gui pode também responder. Ok. Obrigado pela sua atenção. <laughs> Thank you a lot for your nice presentation. Uh, questions? Perguntas? Se alguém quiser fazer em português, a gente traduz. Ah, ele entende, é. Uh, bom, então vou fazer pergunta em português, que para mim fica muito mais fácil também. né? Uh, parabenizar a professora pela excelente palestra. A minha pergunta é muito mais do, do consumidor do que do pesquisador. É, o consumo de embutidos no Brasil talvez seja bem menor do que da região da sua origem. Lá, né? Talvez Bulgária, Alemanha, ali se consome muito embutido. Aqui no Brasil, não sei, não tem estatística disso. Mas, enfim, o que nos dizem, ou a classe médica diz, é evitar o consumo de embutidos ou consumir menos esse tipo de produto. Por quê? Por causa da gordura, alguém já falou aqui atrás, mas principalmente por causa de alguns elementos tóxicos, nitratos, nitritos. Então, a gente fica meio assim, pô, tem aquela linguiçinha, né, que a gente quer assar, que o nosso semana, olhando para ela e fala, pô, mas será que é legal consumir esse tipo de produto? Então, vai a pergunta. Uh, como é que os probióticos poderiam nos ajudar a diminuir esses fatores uh, menos interessantes né, dos embutidos, essas substâncias, essas moléculas que são nocivas à nossa saúde? Na verdade, eu vou responder em inglês, porque as outras pessoas não falam português. O problema com a cultura culture, eu já estou 10 anos aqui, I realized the Brazilian culture is no culture to eat the fermented meat products. In Brazil, it's always meat in the, in the barbecue, more or less, fresh meat. Uh, maybe the reason it's traditional things, but if you think about uh, in Brazil, if you go to south of Brazil, there is more German, Polish influence. They have fermented meat products. They eat there. If you go to the north of Brazil, you go like to Serra, to they almost nothing. Look like depends of the colonization of the country. Get uh, everyone come with his own traditional products. But then in the time, they just start uh, disappear from the market. There was not any more made it, um, no, no, not be produced. In my opinion, I like that this fermented meat products, different salami, copper. Um, presunto, but not presunto like in Brazil, that is a cooked product, like uh, uh, presunto de parma, that is fermented meat product. And in my opinion, it's just a question of the traditional uh, idea, normal food diet in the people here. They just, when you were small, you were eating uh, meat on the barbecue, and you continue eating meat in the barbecue. In Europe, you start in the school, they give you the sandwich with salami, and you eat the sandwich with salami. It's a question of tradition. Then, going uh, to the, the healthy issue, uh, the French people eating the different uh, salami every day, and they're still alive, they're not die. <laughs> the question of the cancer in uh, Europe and in Brazil is more or less the same percentage. So obviously, this kind of that they're always claiming that this is not healthy, not healthy, it's not really uh, scientifically proof that it's really related with the cancer, et etc. so maybe help. But if you look about percentage, more or less the same way. But in these days, there are more than uh, food uh, production. It's they really going out of the high level of salt. They putting some additive that can do the same to, to getting water activity down, but not to be sodium chloride. They are going out of some uh, this nitrite, nitrates, etc. This fancy chemical 
a simple chemical structure, in fact, that was using for the centuries, but they, we have the already technology to, to, to reduce the, this unhealthy part of the, this product. But again, if the traditionally in one family they're not using this product, they're not going to start using these days just because uh, reducing the unhealthy uh, part of the product. So everything is getting to the specificity of the country, not really because it's healthy or it's not healthy. And um, you're lucky in Brazil. We have fresh product all around the year. You don't, in fact, this maybe was the reason they was not start to produce these products here because when the colonizer arrived here, the first people, they, okay, why should make a, a dry meat product for later if I can have the meat all around the year? But same time, if you think about shark, shark been produced always in Brazil and it's a kind of, um, um, it's not fermented, but it's a sun dry meat. Uh, and it was uh, made, but there was um, a story that was telling me recently, they was actually making for the army in the beginning, not for the everyone's consumer. Army wanted to have some kind of uh, food reserve in case something happened. So this was another reason to, to have the product on the market. So it's a very complex. It's not a, just a simple answer, but look like it's a cultural. Alguma outra pergunta? I'm not going to share the foie gras with you. Sorry? I'm not going to share the foie gras with you. <laughs> I will eat it alone. <laughs> we, may, we may think of probiotics in the foie gras production, maybe. It's not yet done, but... It's but actually a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, the question is about uh, virulence genes that you have presented, and you show that, uh, depending on the strain, you have different kind of virulence genes that can be present in the genome of these strains. Are these genes actually proven as expressed in the in the in the human gut because the yeah. presence of mm -hmm. genes is one thing but the expression of these genes uh, is another thing mm -hmm. uh, we first first step we was doing a screening gene is present or not in the pure culture then if the strain was showing just a few genes okay we maybe we can use the strain so we wanted to see if the strain will be expressed, mm. but we was not using the model like a uh, human model to, to do it. We do it in the laboratory condition, uh, mimicking, uh, making the model of the condition of the gut, like uh, temperature, uh, uh, specific bioacidity, uh, et cetera, condition, like static condition, growing can see. And uh, very interesting, some of these genes, they was not expressing in the normal 37 degree. Mm -hmm. So we have the strain that we use in the milk products. Uh, this strain was showing the expression only in 43. And obviously, cannot be a problem. So the next step when we was doing this screening, we was checking uh, if the expression was really by RT-PCR. Mm -hmm. um, we was checking if the strain can be really expressed, these genes. But again, uh, if we can have the strain that is nothing, it's better. If we can has, have a couple of genes that not express, OK. Mm -hmm. But then I'm always afraid of say it's safe because and what about if the specific condition on the specific food diet mm -hmm. with the presence of another component and mm -hmm. the uh, temperature of body temperature could be expressed mm -hmm. because we not at this moment I don't think we can make a really model that we cover all the options we make a healthy situation 37 and uh, like more or less healthy condition, mm. but maybe if uh, there is a different diet could be influenced. Mm. So a uh, couple of years ago, um, we checked some of commercial strains from the company, like a controls, because we think that will be free of virulent genes. Mm. They showed the positive. Mm. Uh, two weeks later, I met with the, the director of the company in the conference and said, listen, some of you strains have some problems. One week later, the strain was out of the market. Mm -hmm. They took away, they wanted to check, they mm. checked, they found that true, some of these strains been positive, they never put it back on the market. Mm. Other strains was clean, they put it. So it was a uh, responsibility of the company it's, uh, to be sure that they're providing the uh, strain. The reason it's most of these genes was never been looked because the gene is uh, typical for enterococci and no one was looking for lactobacilli or lactococci 
then again, what's the question if we express or not need the entire operon to be to work? If mm -hmm. it's just a gene, sometimes it's there, but, but the question, why the gene is there? Mm -hmm. If the bacteria don't need a gene, she's not going to keep it, she will kick it out. Mm -hmm. But look like in the some moments in the genetic transfer, the horizontal gene transfer was occur. Look like some of the genes uh, been there, but no one was looking. These days, with the full genome sequence, we can detect them and see. Wow, well, they are there, mm -hmm. even on the other strains. So it's um, look like we don't know too much about the, the genome of the bacteria. We know some things, but every day we build more and more information, and something that we in the past we was thinking that is safe this day. Not it's not know. anymore, yeah. but this is normal. Even the chemical additives that we use in the food product. In the past when they start using, they was thinking it's okay, they can be used. Then later they discovered no, they cannot be because they have some toxic effect, cancerogenic effect, etc. So they take it out. So it's a normal process. Mm -hmm. Something that we believe these days is a safe, maybe tomorrow will be shown that it's not. So uh, but in my opinion, every strain going in the food consumption doesn't matter if it's human for the animals need to be screened. I don't know. This is the question. What is the panel? How many genes we need to check? Yeah. Um, it's difficult to answer because I, we had the panel with uh, 13. Then we get to panel, I think, 54. We can go to the panel with 100 and always will be something. Yeah. And always will be some research that will climb, but why you don't check another one? We try to cover the genes that are normally present in this species, but sometimes uh, we need to extend the, the to more. But maybe whole genome sequencing technologies mm -hmm. that yeah. will become maybe cheaper, that will help mm -hmm. also to get the yeah. full picture of wha what, what's inside. With there. the full genome sequence, you already have these uh, results. Some strains, they were full genome sequence. They were making uh, analysis and say, yeah, there is a gene. There was uh, other there around him that can actually express the, the, this gene, so. But uh, I think for the commercial strains, maybe it's a good uh, option. Full okay. genome sequence need to be, in one moment, maybe will need to be like a essential part yeah. to be uh, authorized the strain to go on the market. Yeah. It's not any more rocket science. This is no. getting like routine. Yeah. No more questions? Okay, everyone can take one piece of paper. We can make a test now. Exam. <laughs> okay. Obrigado, Slav. Pessoal, a gente tem uma parada agora para o coffee break e a gente retorna às dez e meia. Bom. É, então, pessoal, atrasou uns minutinhos. Eu acho que está chegando o café. E a gente mantém o Coffee VIP no meu laboratório para os patrocinadores e palestrantes. Certo? Vou antecipar já uma coisa que eu ia dizer daqui no final da, da manhã, porque eu também vou ter que dar uma saidinha agora. É, para a parte de veterinária, a gente estava usando a OL44, mas o projetor não está muito bom. Então, a gente vai fazer uma substituição pela 42. Certo? Então... E na 42, tinha uma atividade com a graduação que a gente vai trocar, trocar para 44, certo? Então, é isso. São salas que ficam uma do lado da outra. Se vocês se enganarem, ali é só ir na sala do lado. Ok? E a tarde vai estar um pouco mais lotado. E também lembro vocês que, não sei se isso ficou bem claro, mas é, vocês podem transitar entre as áreas de veterinária e, e alimentos. né? Não existe nenhuma restrição em relação a isso. Ok? Então, um bom café a todos. <risos>